say thank you to Tommy and Kelly and our guest violinist Joe for leading us so well. And, and this is not to praise them, but to praise the God who gave them such wonderful gifts and for using them to lead us in worship. So thank you. Let's pray once more and ask God to speak to us. Father, we come to your word now and we trust because you told us in it that it is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, able to divide even our very intentions. So divide us, speak to us, change us through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not, I've been feeling progressively uh, less than 100% all day, so if I pass out, it's probably not because I'm playing in the spirit, although you never know. Uh, <laughs> Last week, if you were here, Pastor Sterling um, or talked to us about from Genesis 3, verses 1 through 10. This is the story of what went wrong, right? We're in the story of God. We've been looking at uh, all that God made and how it was all good. And then in Genesis 3, which is like act, act 1 of the story of God, closes with chapter 2, verse 25, they were both naked and felt no shame. And Act 3 opens up, and things get bad from there. Theologians call this the fall, the fall into sin and the curse that follows it. So you could think of 1 through 10 as kind of like what happened, and then uh, 8 through 24, where there's a little bit of overlap there for reasons we'll make sense of in a minute, as what are the consequences of what happened? What's been the effect since? That's where we are today. In the world of competitive sports and in life, I'm continually amazed at what a big difference little things make. You know, his toe was just in bounds, just out of bounds. If you watch the, the, I mean, well, you don't have to ask me. You could ask a guy named Steve Bartman in 2003 what a big difference little things make, reaching for a parent foul ball. I know even bringing that up, I think, makes me feel better about tonight. So just <laughs> when it comes to the story of Adam and Eve, I think it's tempting for us to think about it like this. Well, what's the big deal? I mean, okay, they, they did wrong. They ate an apple or a fruit that God said not to. Okay, naughty. Don't do that again. Let's restart this whole thing. Why couldn't God act that way? I mean, didn't he kind of overreact? Why did such a small, seemingly small act cause such cosmic, cataclysmic consequences? But it was no small act. It was, as we'll see, an act of cosmic treason. An outright defiance of their creator and denial of the one who made them in his image. And as we'll see, the consequences of that act were, are, and continue to be devastating. And each, each week, I don't know if you, I've, you've heard me say this, perhaps you have, that what's, we're, what's being taught to us in Genesis 1 through 3 is so foundational for our faith. If you don't grasp the teaching, the depth of the teaching here, at least to a degree, the rest of the story was not going to make much sense to you. If you don't understand what went wrong and what that has produced in the world and in us, then God's response to that isn't going to quite have the power, the significance in your life. That's why we're spending two weeks on the bad news. Frederick Beecher in his book, Telling the Truth, The Gospel is Tragedy, Fairy Tale, and Comedy, says before the gospel can be good news, it must be bad news. We've got to face what's wrong before we can understand what God has done. So if you have your Bible, open to Genesis 3, verses 8 through 13. We'll take this text in sections here. Or you can follow on the screen. Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. We'll stop there. Some of you are chuckling already. Don't be so fast. <laughs> first thing I want to point out is the hiding. The first response of Adam and Eve when sin comes into the world, when they've done wrong, when they've disobeyed their, their, their God's good laws. I mean, I, don't you ever stop and think about this? I mean, sometimes familiarity with this text breeds sort of, we think we know. But how did it, how did it happen? That the first man and the first woman who knew uninhibited intimacy with God and with each other and with all creation could ever come to the place where they would think that this is better than that. It's, it's unbelievably tragic. They hid. Why did they hide? 
the first response of sin before God says a word is covering up from each other and hiding from God. <laughs> Some of you parents will have this experience playing hide and seek with your kids when they're little. They're not that good at it. I always won when my kids were little. <laughs> right? Benjamin, my youngest son, he's a sophomore in high school now. He used to think, like many young, young children, if I can't see you, you can't see me. He would cover his face and stuff it in the cushions, you know, with his little butt up in the air and giggle. And I'd walk around going, where's Benjamin, you know, <laughs> pretending I couldn't find him. It's instinctive in us. The picture of Adam and Eve trying to hide in the bushes from God is quite ridiculous if you think about it. Some of you heard this before, but just, just imagine that for a minute. He came walking in the garden of the cool of the day. The implication is he'd done this before. And they never hid before. Now they're hiding. And he asks the first of a series of questions which reveal the character of God. He says, where are you? Think about that. Where are you? Now, of course, he knows exactly where Adam is. He has not misplaced him. He's not confused like we get. I remember years ago, uh, shopping in Target. Um, I had a list for my wife, and I was getting a bunch of things, and there was a guy that I had been in relationship with in our church, but he, I, I knew from a distance from other people that he had made some decisions that were destructive to himself and to his family, and was, um, his marriage was in trouble, and he wasn't around the church much. I had reached out to him, and he hadn't responded, and I, it had been months since we had any communication. And I saw him in Target, and he saw me. You know, from across like the, the granola bar aisle, you know. <laughs> I can see in his eyes, oh, the pastor sees me. He went down and walked the other way, and I thought, should I, should I, should I just should we play a little game, you know? I, I, I think it's such a human thing to run from what we most need. I'm not, I wasn't chasing him down in Target. God is not out to get us when we sin, if you belong to him. He's out to restore us, redeem us draw us out of hiding. The results of sin are always alienation, isolation, separation from each other and from God. I think God is making two points to Adam and to us. You're lost. And I'm coming to find you. And that beautiful picture is played out over and over and over again throughout the story of God. You're lost, but I'm coming to find you. I'm not sure if Pastor Sterling talked about this last week, but in case you missed it, when God went walking in the garden to find them, think about that for a minute. He could have said, they're on their own. You ever go on a trip and then look back and think, that was not really worth it. You know, like if, you, if, if I knew now what this was going to cost me financially, emotionally, whatever, you would maybe do it different. But God knew exactly what it was going to cost him to step out into the garden. And he went anyway. This is the hiding. And we all hide. Notice what Adam says in verse 10. I was afraid because I what? What does he say? I was naked. You know, is that funny? Is that curious? He doesn't say I was afraid because I sinned. I was afraid because I did wrong. I was afraid of you. He said I was afraid because I was naked. But God didn't create him with clothes on. He's been naked the whole time. This is what it means when it, when in verse 7 when immediately their eyes were opened and they realized for the first time in human history they have something to cover up, something to be ashamed of, something that's not right about them. Adam's nakedness was not his problem. It was his sin. And that is what God comes to deal with. But there's something else in here that I w- want to see before we move on. In verse 11, when God says, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? Does that sound like parental almost? Have you done, have you been bad, you know? Have you eaten of the tree? What does Adam say? The woman, the woman that you gave me. So really, God, if you'd not made her and give her, given her to me, we wouldn't be in this mess. So I guess you could say it's your fault, God. I mean, really, if you think about it, you're the creator. You knew this was going to happen. I corresponded with a man over via email just this week about that very question. Why did God do that if he knew it was going to go south? Why make us? Parents? love your children, you know there's a very strong possibility they will break your heart in small ways and in large. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's part of what it means to be human. So they blame, and not only does Adam blame, but the woman blames too. Adam points a finger at her, and she points the finger at the serpent. The serpent that you made, right? They're all by, by inference saying, God, really, you're the one to blame here. At least we, there's mitigating circumstances. 
You ever notice you don't have to teach your children how to blame and hide? Anybody have to teach them that? Anybody ever, any, any of you moms and dads instruct your children, here's what you do when you're wrong, blame somebody else and run and hide. Anybody do that? But we seem to have this instinct, right? We know how to do it. <laughs> we have this story we tell in our family all the time. I have three children. My youngest, I mentioned Benjamin, and he's the snooper in Christmas time. He cannot stand it. And he knows where the presents are. We don't have a very, uh, our house is not hard to find stuff in. And so he found them. And we discovered that they had been all opened and tried to tape back together. But he was like eight, so he raps like I rap. <laughs> it's obvious that mommy did not rap this, you know. So we fed them all down and asked them the questions. Noah, my oldest, is a straight shooter. He called himself out at second base one time. The ump said, okay, you're out. You know, he's just honest as the day is long. Hannah, I could tell, is not a good liar, and she, she was telling the truth. But Benjamin said, well, maybe it was Noah. <laughs> because he's the one that knows where they are. So it turns out Noah had told Ben where they were, and Ben did his bidding. The truth of the gospel, friends, is that we deal with our guilt not by pointing the finger or running and hiding, but by running to him who we've offended. That's the beauty of the gospel. Let's look at the rest of the story, at least the next section of it. Verses 14 through 19. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing, in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you should not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat the bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That's a cheery thought, isn't it? The curse. Theologians call this the curse. God questions Adam and Eve not because he's angry with them. He, he does not question the serpent. You notice that? God questions Adam and Eve. Why? To draw them out, to bring them out of hiding, to establish relationship, to give them a hope of redemption, even in the midst of consequences. But for the serpent, there's no questioning. There's no hope of redemption. It's simply... This is what's going to happen to you now. <laughs> I, I know that uh, people debate, well, what was the serpent before the curse? Did he have legs? Did he have feet? Was he crawling? Was he not crawling? Was he flying? Was he walking? Was he These are the wrong questions, friends. What we're told here, to crawl on your belly and to eat dust, is a picture of total defeat and humiliation. Notice in the, verse, in, in, in the beginning of chapter 3, we're told, now the serpent was more crafty than all the other creatures God had made. He's a created being. Why did God allow him in the garden in the first place? We aren't told. I would put it in the category of the earlier question. Why did God make us knowing it could go wrong? There had to be the possibility for rejection in order for love to exist. He is a created being. He's not God's opposite. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He doesn't know your every thought. He's not speaking to you in your dreams. He's not. He has power but limited power. This crawling on your belly and eating dust is an image for us of our enemy. Satan is never called, he's called our enemy. The adversary. He's been defeated, is being defeated, and will be defeated. That's this picture. That's the picture we're given of him right here in Genesis. And then verse 15. Perhaps the best verse in this whole passage, but a little bit obscure for some of you who maybe perhaps haven't heard this before. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Some translations say seed of the woman or crush your head. This is what theologians refer to as the proto-evangelion. <laughs> e the evangel is the good news. Proto before. It's before the good news. It's the good news before the good news. In other words, it's a hint even in the midst of like the most tragic, bleak picture in the Bible, we get a little glimmer of the gospel. Who are the descendants, offspring, seed of the woman? Does the serpent have kids? Well, yeah, I mean physically, but that's not what 
God is saying. What's he saying? It's a description of the historic sort of, uh, the, the historic conflict and clash down through the ages between those who belong to Christ and those who work against what God would do in the world. In John 8, 44, Jesus says, you have your father the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. The truth is not in him, and you're just like him. And then God says, he shall crush your head. Her offspring is plural, but the woman's offspring is singular. Did you ever notice that? He. Who's he? Down through all the genealogies, which we'll get to in a few weeks, which are really fun. It is a picture of Christ. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, to defeat sin and death once for all. The cross and the empty tomb are the place where our enemy is mortally wounded and even now lays dying. How beautifully ironic, then, that God's promise of a redeemer comes in the context of sin and judgment. And don't you see this over and over and over again? God could have kicked him out and been justified in doing it. I mean, it's not like God is an angry stepfather who chases them down, chews them out, curses everything in sight, slams the door, locks it behind him, and says, you're on your own. That's not our God. He pursues them. He loves them. He woos them back to himself. And even in their consequences, there are glimmers of hope. He doesn't destroy them, though he'd be just in doing so. He hints at a way back. J.R.R. Tolkien, who was a good friend of, an, friend of another man, that you might know his name. Do you know? C.S. Lewis, they were good friends in Oxford. Tolkien uh, coined a word called the U-catastrophe, E-U, catastrophe, the good destruction. He said, you know, we all know about the catastrophe or the tragedy in literature, right? The unexpected sudden turn for the bad. It breaks our heart. Oh, I never saw that coming. Or you, maybe you do feel it coming. It makes the story great, but sad. The U-catastrophe is the opposite. The sudden, surprising, unlooked for, unexpected turn for the good where what you thought all was lost and something beautiful happens. That's the heart of the gospel. And right here in Genesis 3, we're getting a glimmer of it. The cross is the, uh, is the ultimate you catastrophe, isn't it? Defeat of God's son, death. Not so much. And then God says to the woman, in pain you will have childbirth and pain. What's he talking about here? Since the fall, a universal reality for all of us is that joy and pain sit side by side in human experience. Walter Kaiser in his commentary says, there's no more unmitigated good, unmixed good in human ex experience. Meaning, even the best things, like, bear, like children, bring pain. There's pain and struggle and strife and difficulty mixed in with the good things. So God doesn't remove the good entirely, but it's tainted now. It's not what it could have been. And then the second half of the verse, God says, your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, the <laughs> debates rage in the church and in Christian academies about what does this mean for gender roles in the home, and is, is we supposed to reverse the curse or not? God said it. Is, it. is it? The primary point is this. The primary point is that what God made good, the relationship of the man and the woman, has been corrupted. Now, a harmonious, loving Selfless relationship is a struggle, right? It's not easy. You have to work hard at it. The current of our lives and our hearts is away from that, is away from generosity and kindness and forgiveness and love, it's, right? It's, we have to fight for that. We see then that in these verses to come, these ones we're looking at, that our relationship with our Creator, with each other, with all creation have been put off kilter. Both the man and the woman will, not have, will have to struggle now to lay aside their desires. Some say, well, it's sexual desire. She has sexual desire, but, but he's going to use that over her. Some say, well, no, no, it's the desire to lead, leadership and ruling desire. And she wants to lead her husband, but he's supposed to lead over her, and they fight about it. I think it's all of it. The point is, the man and the woman now have to fight their own desire, their own inclination to dominate, to have their way. Lay that aside. In Ephesians 5.21, the Apostle Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the umbrella over the marital relationship. Now I want you to see something else here. God's not really cursing Adam and Eve in the sense that we think about it. If you hear the word curse, what do you think of? A witch, maybe? You know, a spell or something like that? Like a curse? He cast a curse on them? God is not um, causing these things to happen. 
That's not the kind of curse this is. He is, quite literally, explaining to them the consequences that are already in place. He's saying, this is what you have done, and this is what now is. They're already hiding. They're already covering up. They're already blaming. They're already lying. It's already happened, right? God is now saying. So it's not like God swoops in and says, you're on the ground, and you're going to be in pain, and you're going to have to work hard. He's saying, what you've done, there are irreversible consequences this side of heaven. Like a doctor. This man goes to see a doctor who's been drinking and abusing alcohol for 25 plus years and has bad liver disease. The doctor spells it out for him. He's not causing the disease. He's saying, this is what is now. But God doesn't leave us there. He does not leave us there. We move on to Adam's curse, or Adam, the consequences for Adam. In some ways, I think for him, it's the most severe and, and the most comprehensive because in verse 17, he says, because you have done this, listen to your wife. Now, it, it's not saying men do, men do not walk out of here thinking, I don't have to listen to my wife. It says so right there in Genesis 3. That's not what it says. Insofar as she went against the word of God, which Adam should have known because he was there in the beginning. He should have been protecting her, looking out for her, guarding her against deception, but he didn't. And so when she was led astray and he followed, abdicating his rightful place of leadership and, let, and followed her, they're both in the wrong. But Adam, God is saying to Adam, I hold you accountable. And because of your sin, the gr- cursed is the ground, all creation. All of creation now. Romans chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. We have it, we have it. I don't have it. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be, be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Talking about Genesis 3. All creation is off now. And groans and longs and waits, as do we, to be made right. Now let's look at the last part here. The covering. At the end of verse 19 is the final and most devastating part of the curse. God says, now to dust you will return. Death has now entered the scene. It's been hanging out there, right? If you eat of it, you'll die. You'll not surely die. God's keeping you down. This death piece has been out there, but now it enters in. Now we're, we're told, yes, it, death's a reality. It's the ultimate intruder. John Donne's poem, Death Be Not Proud, does a beautiful job of describing this. But it's not the final word. Let's read the last couple verses of chapter 3. And the man called his wife's name Eve. Now, we've been calling her Eve all along, but here he names her. So before this, she was just, whoa, man. You know, that was what he called her before, woman. Actually, uh, Isha is the Hebrew word, but she, whatever he called her, it was, a, it was a good name. Now he names her Eve, and the word Eve means life giver, or it's from the root of the Hebrew word for life giver. How fascinating. Right after God talks about death, returning to dust, going back to the ground from which you came, God, Adam says, I'm calling her life giver. Why? Because he knows that he's taking God at his word, that from her offspring will come our hope. So you, have you ever wondered how the people in the Old Testament are saved? If it's before Jesus, you ever wonder that question? The same way you and I are, by trusting in the word of God. They look forward to it through a veil. We look back with clarity to what Christ has done. God said, I'll put enmity between you two. There's going to come one from you, Eve, who will be the champion, who will destroy death, who will crush the enemy's head. And Adam calls her that. I think it's beautiful that he refers to it as that. And then verse 21, I lost my place again. And the Lord God made for Adam for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. Closes with a bit of a sad note. But not completely so. Verse 21 The covering. God's provision of clothing goes beyond the mere mere need now that they're naked and they're embarrassed. They just need something to cover up now. That's not all that it's saying. It's a picture of God's provision for them for their sin. Remember, what is Adam's problem? His nakedness? No, his sin. And God's going to deal with that. And he 
covers them in skins of animals. Well, where, where were the animals? Where were the animals? Presumably walking around innocently in the garden, created good. Now they must die and be sacrificed and be skinned to cover the sin of the man and the woman. That too is a theme we're going to see played out over and over and over again in the story of God. Sin requires a sacrificial covering. Let me give you four implications really briefly here. Number one, what this is telling us is that we need a covering for our sin. You can't walk naked up to the White House steps and expect to have a nice interview with the president, whoever that may be. We need a covering for our sin. You and I are not okay on our own. We can't walk right into God's presence. Number two, our attempts to cover ourselves are wholly inadequate. They're fig leaves, right? Sewn together. At best, hiding a little bit. You know, all the things you base your sense of self on. All the things that you, that you long for and daydream about and, and feel like, if I have this, then my life is together. They are inadequate to cover your sin. They are but fig leaves. Number three, only God can provide the covering we need. See how simple but so profound this is? You need to be covered. You can't cover yourself. I must cover you, God says. And number four, the covering God provides requires the death of an innocent substitute. That's the harsh reality. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 tells us this. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The Hebrew word for covering here is the word kofar, and it literally means atonement. It doesn't just mean coat. Ultimately, you and I are either standing in front of a holy God covered in fig leaves of our own goodness, or we're covered in the robes of righteousness that God offers in Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no other choice. There's no middle ground. This is why in Romans 5, 19, the Apostle Paul says, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Friends, what we gain in Jesus Christ is not readmission to the garden. That is in the past. There is no going back. It's sealed. What we gain in Jesus is far better, actually. You ever think about that? It's far greater. You gain admission into his kingdom on earth and for all eternity. It's like a, a child growing up who's innocent, and we wish that would stay forever, but the truth is they're not really going to be a full whole person unless they go through some things, right? And then, re- and then wake up on the other side and realize the true beauty of their father. There's no going back, but there is going forward. Because, did you know that in the book of Revelation, there is, the tree of life shows up again in Revelation 22, giving healing to the nations? Let me close with this little bit from C.S. Lewis's book, The Voyage of a Dawn Treader. If you've not read this book, um, it's a story of uh, the Pevensey, Lucy Pevensey, who's in a wizard's uh, uh, magic home. She finds a book that uh, tells the greatest story she's ever read. She says, on the next page, page, she came to a spell for the refreshment of the spirit. The pictures were few, but they were quite beautiful. And what Lucy found herself reading was more like a story than a spell. It went on for three pages, and before she had read to the bottom of the page, she had forgotten that she was reading it all. She was living in the story, as if it were real all around her. And the pictures were real, too. When she had got to the third page and come to the end, she said, that is the loveliest story I've ever read in my entire life. And it's a lovely story I shall ever read in my entire life. Oh, I wish I could have gone on reading it for 10,000 years. At least I'll read it over again once more now. But here the part of the magic book came into play. You could not turn back. The right-hand pages, the ones ahead, could not be turned. But only the left-hand pages could. Oh, what a shame, said Lucy. I did so want to read it again. Well, at least I must remember it. Let's see, it was about, about... Oh dear, it's fading away again. How can I have forgotten? It's about a cup and a sword and a tree and a green hill and... But I can't remember. And she never could remember. And ever since that day, what Lucy means by a good story is a story which reminds her of the forgotten story in the magician's book. Child, said Aslan. Did I not explain to you once before that no one has ever told what would have happened? No one can ever go back? Yes, Aslan, you did, said Lucy. I'm sorry. 
Shall I ever be able to read the story again, the one I can't remember? Will you tell it to me, Aslan? Indeed, yes. I will tell it to you for years and years and years to come. But now we must beat the mast. I think what we're being told here in Genesis 3, like from the literary perspective, backing up in the story of God, is this. What went wrong is horrifically tragic, but it's not the final word. We can't go back in our lives. We can't go back and undo those things. We can go forward into his grace and his mercy and his kingdom. Let's stand for closing prayer. Father God, we acknowledge that your word is true even if we struggle to understand it. And I don't know the hearts of everyone here this evening, Lord, but you know them. You know them intimately. You know their fears and their hang-ups, and you know the things that they're plaguing their minds and their hopes and their joys, their deep shame and sorrow. And in a way, God, we're all like Adam and Eve, hiding and blaming to a degree. But you, O Lord, are a good and gracious God. You pursue us to find us to redeem us, and to call us home. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.